Welcome. As if I'd not known it previously, the past couple of weeks have reminded me that Des was and remains a, confident, a controversial person. But we've not come here to talk about that or even to remember that. We've come to remember Des's outstanding contribution to Avondale, especially during the 1960s and 70s, and, talk, and to talk together about how we experienced him as a person. And in doing that, I hope that we will physically and symbolically wrap our arms around Gillian, who is here with us today, and his children, Alain, Paul and Luke and their loved ones. So just to get our minds in the right frame, I'll start by remembering what it was like sitting in my first classes with Dr. Des Ford. And remember that as students, we called him Dr. Ford. Those were the days when you didn't address your lecturers by their first name. Now when I wander around campus, students say, hi Ray. <laughs> Just very, very different days. I have to say that I found it quite disconcerting to sit in Jez's classes. I'd just come from four years of nurses training at the SAN, where we'd learnt things like wound management, and where, we could, and, and where I could take really coherent class notes on kinds of wounds, what to do about them, and the ill effects if we manage them incorrectly. But my notes from Des's classes were all over the place. It wasn't that he didn't have an organised mind, but rather that he was wanting to inspire a relationship with Jesus Christ rather than just provide information. And there were really no textbooks for that, other than what was very obviously his obsession, the Bible and the Desire of Ages. Des Ford was not just a theoretical theologian, he could be intensely practical as well. I remember Des answering our questions down by the river at Crossland's youth camp. And I have to say, he was an amazing answerer, if that's a word. It, the spell check didn't reject it anyhow. <laughs> I think it was my own class's ministry students retreat. And I, because I can only remember my classmates, my actual classmates at that retreat. And I can also remember that Alan Bates, fell out of, a top, out of a top bunk in his sleeping bag and broke his collarbone, and me as a nurse being called to attend him in the middle of the night, and Alan telling me that he'd been dreaming that he was falling. <laughs> but my dominant memory is of a married student very seriously asking Des how often a married couple should sleep together. And Des's answer, if when you get up in the morning and you can't pull up the line, it's probably too much. <laughs> and I have to say to you that I want you to know that I have always personally used that as a rule of thumb. So, welcome again as the Avondale family reflects and cries and laughs as we together remember Des Ford and actually engage in some wound management and healing. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and God join me in a word of prayer. 
God of grace, today is a sad day. We come to you with heavy hearts. Grief and loss are real today, especially for Joel and the family and close friends. God of grace, we thank you for this gift of grace. Grace so abundant, grace so absolute, grace so available, provided because of and through Jesus Christ. Grace so passionately shared by your servant, Des Ford. God of grace, much has been said about Des, the academic and theologian. Today we gather to remember Des as husband, father, teacher, pastor, and friend. We will remember the passion, dedication, and enthusiasm, and energy that characterized everything he did. We remember it was always a challenge to keep up with Des, whether in the grasp of ideas, or in a power walk around campus when our intention was just for a relaxing stroll or a quiet conversation. For now, this tireless warrior for the gospel is resting, free from all the challenges and struggles, <coughs> safe in your everlasting embrace, waiting for the morning. Today is a sad day, and as we pause to remember Des, grant us all the calm assurance promised in the good news of the gospel. Bless this gathering with your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You've heard from Professor Ray Roenfeld, Avondale student in the early 70s, and Dr. Graham Stacey, Avondale student from 1967 to 70. My name is Lyle Heiss, Avondale student, 66 to 69. I will be your host for this afternoon. We three and those speakers to follow, and indeed all of you, are united in profound love and respect for our teacher, mentor and friend, Dr Desmond Ford. This is our opportunity to gather round our alma mater, Avondale, and around the memory of our friend, to grieve, to laugh, to smile, and indeed to thank God for the blessings and joy that flowed our way from the combination of a great teacher and a great place. They operated together to bless us and through us to bless others. This is also our opportunity to grieve with Gillian and with the Ford family and to support them in their journey of healing. Milton Hook is uniquely positioned to launch our reflections this afternoon. He is, after all, the biographer of Desmond Ford and the author of Avondale Experiment on the Dora, covered both ways. Milton qualified for both teaching and ministry during his five years at Avondale. Desmond returned from study in the US with a PhD degree in 1961. Milton was waiting, and he schemed his way into the very first class on offer, and as many others as possible after that. Almost a lifetime later, Milton offers us now a life sketch of that teacher he first met in 1961. Desmond Ford was born in Townsville on February 2, 1929, raised in that district. His parents were nominal Anglicans. His father worked as a post office telegrapher. 
His mother was the first family member to show an interest in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, especially its health emphasis, but she never became a member. They moved south to Sydney, where Desmond completed his schooling and began a cadetship in journalism at a newspaper office. He was an avid reader, studying a number of Adventist volumes, the Bible course from Adventist Radio Church. An Adventist member gave him a Bible that he read through before he had completed elementary school. He was baptised in 1946 and immediately prepared to attend Avondale College for ministerial studies. Dr. William Murdoch was principal of Avondale at the time. Desmond attended some of his Bible classes and was impressed with both his scholarship and character. Murdoch became a mentor for Ford. Desmond graduated in 1950 and served an internship in the North New South Wales Conference. In 1952, he married his college sweetheart, Gwen Burge, an elementary school teacher. Together, they served for five years in various districts of the North New South Wales Conference. In 1958, Desmond returned to study at Avondale College, graduating from the Bachelor of Arts in Theology. Under sponsorship, he then attended the SDA Seminary in Washington, D.C., where Murdoch had been transferred, and Edward Hepburn School was also lecturing. Both men agreed that Ford was wasting his time getting a non-accredited degree from the seminary, but should instead apply to enter Michigan State University, and there he completed his PhD in 1960 and returned to lecture in the Theology Department of Avondale College in 1961. During the 1960s, Gwen Ford battled cancer. It finally claimed her life as the sun was setting on Friday, April 24, 1970. Gwen had written a short list of women she thought might replace her as Des's wife and stepmother for their three children. Alain, Paul and Luke. Des was in no hurry to remarry, simply wishing for a quiet haven to pursue further studies. Church administrators advised him that the care of his children and the benefits of marriage outweighed any thought of bachelorhood. So later, he happily chose Gillian Wastel as his new partner. She had been one of Des's students and an assistant at Gwen's nursing home. At times, she had cared for the children during Gwen's illness. In 1971 and 1972, Ford did postgraduate studies at Manchester University and was awarded a PhD in theology after submitting a dissertation on the topic, The Abomination of Desolation. He returned to Avondale College to resume lecturing in 1973. In mid-1977, Ford took up an appointment to lecture at Pacific Union College in California. It was during this term of service that he accepted an offer from the Anglican chapter of the Association of Adventist Forums to speak about the investigative judgment theory. On Sabbath afternoon, October 27, 1979, he presented his landmark address, highlighting key problems with the topic. The airing of the problems, long known to church scholars, unleashed a wave of opposition that prompted the 1980 Glacier View meeting and Ford's eventual firing. Ford had personally wrestled with questions about the investigative judgment from the days of his pastoral ministry, when he encountered many members, some of their deathbeds, who were fearful of losing salvation when their names allegedly came under review during the investigative judgment. A significant element in his response was to emphasize justification by faith 
in Jesus Christ. It became the distinctive characteristic of his preaching and teaching. Attracting thousands to his simple gospel messages, but at the same time drawing fire from a bevy of staunch proponents of perfectionism. The 1960s and 1970s were decades of controversy surrounding perfectionism. Theologians are in the business of juggling hot potatoes. To understand Des as a theologian, it is helpful to understand the biggest hot potato he had to juggle. Some thought the potato was the justification by faith variety. It was not. Roman Catholics and Protestants alike believe in justification by faith. The festering core of the controversy lay in the doctrine of sanctification that spawned perfectionism. It remains a thread in Adventism that has rope proportions. Some, some Christians subscribe to the belief in sacramental sanctification, beginning with the sacrament of infant baptism, proceeding to confirmation, repeated participation in the sacrament of the Mass, attendance at the confessional, and the receipt of the last rites. Sacramental sanctification is advocated as the process of a lifetime. But Seventh-day Adventists have adopted the Wesleyan model. It also teaches that sanctification is the process of a lifetime, beginning with the surrender of the willpower, an, an existential entrance of the Holy Spirit into one's being, obedience to God's commandments, much prayer, the daily study of scripture, and compliance to a long list of behaviours. It takes a lifetime, allegedly, to be perfectly sanctified, and one can never be certain, having reached the end of the road, whether or not one is eligible for heaven. Then there is the simple biblical model of sanctification, best illustrated in the story of the sanctification or consecration of Aaron and his sons to the priesthood. They were set apart from the secular for a sacred calling. The word sanctify carries no hint, either linguistically or contextually, that the priests would grow more righteous day by day. No hint that it was a lifetime process of climbing a moral ladder towards the perfection of character. The word simply means to set apart. In the New Testament sense, sanctification happens at genuine conversion. When one is set apart as a member of the priesthood of all believers, with Christ as one's high priest. Des really attacked the Wesleyan model head on. He preferred to counter perfectionism by preaching justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, in the context of grace alone. He recognised that his audience needed to sense personal sinfulness so that they would reach out for the gift of justification. He placed himself in the same predicament as his audience. He was known to confess, I sin a thousand times a day. It was hyperbolic, of course. But his critics cringed and shuddered when they heard it. One administrator took him aside and said, Des, you shouldn't say that. You should be telling the people that they, they, they can increase in righteousness every day. Ford spent his life bringing Christian assurance to those in the Valley of 
uncertainty. At the same time, he upheld high moral standards, both by word and example. He always advocated good works as gratitude for salvation. At a glacier view, the elephant in the room was perfectionism. One of its chief exponents was Robert Pearson, retired General Conference President. He wrote an eight-page letter to the assembled delegates, wrongfully accusing Des of advocating the once saved, always saved doctrine, teaching a life of spiritual defeat and the lowering of church standards. He said it was cheap grace. The jibe was a terrible slur on the high price paid at Calvary. Calvary was not cheap. There was a remarkable degree of consensus at Glacier View that the champion of the gospel was demonised. The perfectionism that Pearson defended was still intact. The status quo had been maintained and the gospel was rejected by default. After Glacier View, there was a purge of gospel preachers. At a church executive meeting in 1982, sought to cancel Des's ministerial license. It was planned as more than a haircut. The tumbrel was greased and the guillotine sharpened. However, a group of gospel friends in California had already come to his rescue. He'd gone over the wall and down the rap and was engaged in missionary journeys all over the world, armed with the ordination of the Holy Spirit. He retired back in Australia in 2000, setting close to family at Shelley Beach near Caloundra. From there he continued to conduct gospel seminars under the auspices of the Australian branch of Good News Unlimited. He continued to publish his academic legacy being found in more than 30 books. He also recorded many gospel messages for radio. Indicative of an abiding sentimental attachment to Adventism, he and Gillian continued to attend the local Seventh-day Adventist church until death. Health issues prevented it a few months before his demise. Dr. Desmond Ford passed away peacefully on March 11 in the confident assurance of salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ. God is good and his grace still prevails. for everyone to participate in expressing a common theme. You don't have to be a high-powered musician to do this. Rumour has it that Desmond was tone deaf, but that mattered not at all for him or for you. Let me encourage you. If you open your heart to the joy that the lyrics offer, and we have some wonderful lyrics for you, it's almost as though this amazing grace about which we're going to sing becomes more amazing if all the hundreds of us here today sing it together. We have a slightly adjusted version of this hymn. Marion is going to sing the first stanza to remind you of the shape of the song. Uh, you'll do fine and you're encouraged to join after Marion leads us in the first stanza. Will you stand as we sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
here on the volume. And if you've got volume on it now.
is quite an Everdale institution himself. He has invested decades in the place, and in the process, he has become friends with a great collection of Des's friends. How pleasing it is that we get to hear from four of them. There's probably a century of service to Avondale and friendship with the Ford family represented here, and who better than Lyndon to extract some great stories from them. Thanks, Lyndon. Thank you, Lyle. We've got Laurie Draper, Gwen Maharaj, Jan Patrick, and Trevor Lloyd. Laurie, what are your first memories of Des? And how far back does your friendship reach? Well, <clears throat> it's almost 70 years <clears throat> back in 1950 that I remember Des, and I'm just wondering how many people here go back further than that. Uh, in 1950, the boys of Caskell Hall were rostered to take morning and evening dormitory worship. The presentation often consisted of simply reading the Daily Morning Watch devotional. However, one student was notably different and always gained my attention and appreciation. He presented biblical concepts I had never understood before, ideas I later came to know as salvation, assurance, and righteousness by faith. As a child, I had been taught to fear the unexpected close of probation and the certainty of consequently being lost because of a carelessly unconfessed sin. I thank Des Ford that as a troubled teenager, I was introduced to the gospel and over the next 70 years extended my love of the gracious Lord Jesus. Thank you, Laurie. Gwen, you must be one of the very few who's ever gone ocean cruising with the Fords. Tell us about it. In January 1961, excuse me, I boarded the Arcadia in Suva on my way to Avondale to do the Bible instructor's course. Who should be on board? in transit back from the USA where Des had completed his first PhD, but the Ford family. This was the beginning of a wonderful lifelong friendship. Later at Avondale, I found myself as the only female among 10 or so young men, including John Carter, in a biblical theology class. Des, the lecturer, helped me manage the rather obvious gender imbalance. <laughs> we all found his classes very inspirational and enlightening, and class time always ended too soon. Trevor, you, like Laurie, taught at Avondale in the 60s and 70s, didn't you? Yes, that's right. Well, as you've heard, as we've heard, uh, Des came in to be uh, in 1961 as a 33-year-old, 33-year-old to uh, lead the theology department, fresh in from Washington and Michigan State, and it, it was a pleasure to be there. And I came in several years later into the education department. Tell me, Trevor, was Des difficult to get to know? Uh, at no time, Linda. Uh, in fact. Um, I think it was almost the first or second week of classes, Des invited me for lunch. And it was uh, an unusual venue. In fact, it was halfway up One Tree Hill. And there we sat on a log and had a banquet. Uh, he was batching at the time, Ben was away, and I was a bachelor. And he brought out this magnificent meal, whole meal gems were first on the item, and then a can of prunes. <laughs> and this was followed by Granny Smith apples. <laughs> and on the strength of it, we walked the mountain trails, talking theology most of the time. Joan, how did the Patricks get mixed up with this Ford? We arrived in Kurumbong um, during September. 
1973. Arthur had been invited to join the theology department by Des, who was its head at the time. We found that a favourite happening amongst the theology staff was a picnic, picnic time up the Bodigans on a Sabbath afternoon. Food is always more delicious when you share it with a friend, especially if it's under an Australian gum tree. And after the meal, and we'd all suitably digested our food, it was time to go exercising. And exercise everyone did, except those who were too, too involved with younger children. And it seemed to me that the faster Des talked, the faster everybody walked. And the feeble were left a long way behind. But that environment formed, formed very strong ties and friendship bonds amongst the faculty of that time. Readers of the record will remember the public banter which went on between Debs and Bob Parr, the magazine Jubilant editor during much of the 70s. Once Des wrote in, you might remember, accusing Bob Parr of having misspelt the word eschatological. <laughs> in the next edition, Bob came back in quick repost. Well, that will teach Des Ford not to mumble. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was the strip cartoon in three frames. I'm hoping that it's up in front of you, featuring the Fordian technique. Three frames. Des pensively listening. You can't be serious asking a question like that. And the next? Oh well, I suppose I'd better give him some kind of an answer. And then with Des in full flow, nonsense! The hermeneutics of such an eschatological exegesis are preposterous. <laughs> Bob always got the last word. Trevor, how would you describe Des's relationship with the student family? It was in the late uh, I in uh, 1965, I was asked to be the faculty advisor to the Jacaranda group, and, and this group sat and had to choose the uh, faculty member to whom they would dedicate the Jacaranda for that year. There was no doubt as to uh, whom they would choose, uh, and the Jacaranda photographer made his way, as he did to all the faculty, of course, to take the photograph. And he stood in the passageway there in the white building and took a photograph of Des at his desk. As far as I'm concerned, I think it's one of the loveliest photographs we've ever had. I, I, I liked it at the time and I still do. And then they added this uh, magnificent tribute, which um, I think we can have on the screen as well, can we? And uh, here it is, from the heart. In gratitude for guidance in decision, assurance in doubt, in admiration for inspiring ministry, aspiring challenge, we dedicate Jack Aranda 1965 to Dr. Desmond Ford, a life lived amongst us, as one of us, for all of us. And uh, it seems to me that that has uh, encapsulated the, uh, the attitude which they took to their, uh, their beloved lecturer. Thanks, Trevor. A number of those who've been unable to join us this afternoon have been in contact. Ron Allen worked with Des for many years. He writes, I first met Desmond Ford as a student in his theology classes. I was awed by his erudition, his rapid-fire discourse, and his disciplined ways. When I later worked with him, Des always treated me as an equal, and he was fun to be with. Des had an unconfined freedom in laughter, replete with much striking of fist in palm and slapping of knee, making it hard not to succumb. We often travelled together, and this was not without its moments. Once I sat opposite him in a suburban train and feigned nonchalance while he munched noisily on a bag of carrots, juice flying. <laughs> Few could match Des's self-regulatory powers, yet he never made them a rule for others. He enabled me to be me in ministry, to fight in my own armour, an extraordinarily beautiful gift. The grace of God was Des's ruling theme and his controlling purpose. Thank you, Des. 
Joan, your email has been running pretty hot too. Uh, you've got a message from another distant friend. Dr. Lynn Behrens grew up in Krumbong and um, went on to study medicine in Sydney and became president of London Linda University. She writes, Des's focus was always on God's love and grace, the good news of the gospel. The only sermon I clearly remember from my childhood was by Dr. Ford when he was uh, a still a theology student. He spoke about the book of Esther, in which God's leading and providence pervade the story in dramatic fashion, although God's name is never mentioned. It still seems to me a metaphor for daily living. More personally, I shall always be grateful for God's leading through Dr. Ford in a providential meeting decades ago. As a young resident doctor in Sydney, I was enjoying a special friendship with a non-practicing Christian. My struggle with this relationship came to a head during a sleepless overnight train ride from Sydney to Melbourne Youth Congress. Dr. Ford happened to join my train and we travelled part of the journey together. For an hour he became my big brother. His non-judgmental listening and inspired wisdom enabled me to choose a future which kept Christ at the centre of my life. I shall always be grateful for that pivotal meeting. Laurie, what was it like living on Sandy Creek near the Fords? Our association with uh, Des and Gwen was renewed in the 1960s as near neighbours in the Currens Road, Butler Avenue area. Des rode to work along the bush track past our house, usually about 5am, on a bicycle with a very rattly mudguard. <laughs> that badly irritated our little dog, <laughs> who invariably chased him out of range along the track. <laughs> when you, you worked for Des, what was it like to be his interface with the world? If not the world, certainly the students and the church. During 62 and 63, I worked as his secretary in the afternoons, typing his many letters and articles. All sorts of people wrote to him from all over, and he did his patient best to answer them. I also had to make appointments for those students who wished to speak with him. I was told to allow just 15 minutes. He took the view that people should be able to tell what to tell what you, what they wanted in that time. I learned that time was precious. Often days would take young men for a walk talk. They would often complain that they got breathless keeping up. And, and, may have, and that may have been one of Des's ploys to keep interviews short. <laughs> My husband Sonny remembers having to almost run to keep up with him on one such occasion. Des used to answer questions in the science magazine. They were always pressuring him for an updated photo and he got sick of it. I was instructed to cut his photo out of the latest jacaranda and post that to Warburton. <laughs> John Carter writes from the USA When Des preached the gospel grace broke through like a burst of sunshine on a bleak winter's day He was my Bible teacher at Avondale and subsequently my dear friend for more than 50 years One did not need to always agree with him to love and respect him his teaching on righteousness by faith profoundly and positively impacted the thinking of Adventists worldwide. Des was a gentleman, a scholar, an evangelist, and a brave soldier of the cross. 
we shall not see his like again. That was John. Trevor, how far beyond Bible classes at Allendale uh, was Dez's influence felt? More widely than that around the campus? Yes, indeed. Uh, looking back to the 60s and 70s, I, I see them as the golden years of Allendale. I, I'm terribly prejudiced, of course, but Dez was there for both those decades. And I saw it as a vibrant spiritual tone. And uh, not only the theology students gained at the benefit of Dez's ministry, but church services in chapel were, were a time for spiritual growth, and uh, it, it was a time for learning, and he invited that kind of a response. He had, as, uh, as we all know, a, a, a gentle sense of humour, which uh, kept us all alive and awake, and, and the message was well worth hearing. Friday nights, and I think, uh, Lyle, you mentioned, did you, what it was like to be in the chapel. Here's, uh, here are the students. The, uh, the place is packed to the walls, and uh, they had a, a tough week in class. But come chapel, there was a vibrancy there, and uh, there was spiritual renewal and refreshment, and uh, a lot of this I, I uh, can thank this for under God's leading. And what about beyond Avondale's campus itself, Trevor? How far did Des's influence extend beyond Avondale? Yeah, it, it uh, went to all the local conferences from Perth to Dunedin, as far as I can tell. And there he was, uh, he was a new voice, it was a new hope, it was a new vibrancy, uh, and, uh, and the camp meetings responded wonderfully well. You were aware as well, I assume, Lyndon, that he was invited to university student gatherings, and he was a voice. He was a voice that was desperately needed, and uh, one young medical student, who's still in medical practice today in Victoria, came away saying, Dr. Ford answered all my questions. <clears throat> Laurie, there were some important areas in life in which Des took little interest, were there not? And some in which he was certainly not an expert and couldn't answer any questions. Yeah, that's true, very true. For example, Des had very little interest in motor cars. <laughs> but was eventually forced to purchase a second-hand vehicle to replace his aging bicycle. Shortly afterwards, he was asked by some staff friends what make of car he had bought. He said, I'm sure. A Ford? <laughs> no, no, he said, I'm not sure. He said, what are the names of some of the other mates? <laughs> Likewise, over the many years I have known him, I cannot ever recall any time when Death ever expressed any interest in politics. But it was a different matter if you mentioned Cyrus or the King of the North. <laughs> Jane, you've got something from Mary Trim in London. That's right. She writes, and let me read it to you. Des was my husband's dearest friend, and Gwen, his first wife, was my college roommate. We shared our early years of ministry and became lifelong friends. Later, when Des and Jewel were on their honeymoon, they stayed with us in Bombay, en route to Manchester. Here are just two of many enduring memories. Des wrote to John every week for the five years that John was in the nursing home. And when he visited, he would lie on the bed near him, sharing John's pain. He was a true and loving friend. They had an agreement between them that the funeral of whoever died first would be conducted by the other one. Des's last sermon in Kroombong was preached at John Trim's funeral. Another young immigrant from Russia was advised by Australian government 
officials on his arrival, that Avondale College could be a good place for him to study. Although a non-Christian, he enrolled, but he had minimal English and had difficulty fitting in, so he decided he'd leave, feeling very sad and lost. Des was in Des uh, encouraged him and said, no, don't do that just yet. So the young man stayed, became an Adventist, and forever grateful to Des, and today is father-in-law to one of my daughters, signs Mary. Gwen, you spent quite a deal of time in the Ford home. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, Sunday mornings, I would look after the children while Des and Gwen went for a cycle, as they liked to do. I was often there, and Gwen and I became close friends. When she had her first breast cancer surgery, I stayed with the children, as her sister had been unable to make it over in time. I continue to thank God for the unique privilege of these associations. Laurie, how would you describe Des's enduring legacy to Adventism? In the 1970s, uh, while head of theology at Avondale, Des was in constant high demand as a visiting guest speaker at camp meetings youth rallies, university student conventions, and regional meetings. <clears throat> His meetings were invariably packed out. Many of us sensed a real hunger in the church for spiritual revival. For spiritual revival and the message of the assurance of salvation through a renewed preaching of the gospel. Des responded enthusiastically to this need by accepting invitations to the point of exhaustion. He also had the additional burden of his wife Gwen's slowly encroaching terminal illness. In order to protect his well-being, the college administration found it necessary to limit limit the number of appointments Des could accept. He always abided by these decisions. His legacy is a church that experiences much more salvation assurance. Thank you, Laurie, Gwen, Joan, and Trevor. today have been students of Desmond Ford. It's the student experience that we share that's brought most of us together. We extend our thanks to the students who have returned today from far away places, even I'm told, including one Graham Satchel all the way from Houston, Texas, just for this service. Graham, if you're there, we have a date uh, at the coffee machine at the end. In the people business, we understand the power of mentoring, investing ourselves in those who will stride into the future further than we can go, spreading a gospel message to places and cultures beyond our own reach. 
Dr. David Tasker has spent a lifetime in ministry, teaching and mentoring in a fascinating range of exotic countries all around the world. Today he reflects on Desmond Ford as his Avondale teacher and mentor in the mid-70s. David Tasker. Thank you, Lyle. After hearing all of that, what is there left to say? But I think we should not forget why we're here today, and that is to support uh, the family. The, uh, to Jill, to Ellen, Paul, Luke, please accept our thoughts and prayers that are with you at this time of your loss. I was a student of Dare's in the mid-70s. They were stirring times. An impatient younger generation waiting to sit at the table, but feeling excluded from it. Dare's became the lightning rod for our generation. I remember sitting in his classes, being impressed with his encyclopedic memory. All of the one-liners that he would come out with, he had read from somewhere. He would quote a vast variety of biblical texts, quotes from Ellen White, and a host of influential scholars, the effects of which would not just stay in the classroom, but would buzz around the boys' dormitory halls, and not just the boys' dormitory, but I couldn't tell you about the girls' dormitory, but I'm guessing the same was there as well. His ready wit and his infectious laugh made him easy to approach and to talk to if you could keep up with his fast walking pace, and a few people have mentioned that. But it was not just what he said, it was who he was. He became a powerful model and lifestyle choices. <clears throat> he would go on a five mile run each day, so we as students would go on that five mile run too. He was very careful with his food choices, so we began to do similarly, which was very different to the norm, to the status quo, and to where a lot of us had come from. As well as that, he was the quintessential Christian gentleman. Everyone was treated with dignity and respect, which was in very stark contrast to some of the tactics of his critics. This was something that we as students and the wider community admired him greatly for. What will we take away from this? Laurie mentioned possibilities of, of, her, uh, of um, uh, yeah, it'll come. <laughs> but each of us have our own thoughts. But for me, there's this emphasis on the gospel taught me and the generation of that time that my focus must be on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith, and not on my ability to measure up to other people's expectations, because that was the norm back then. I am firm, first and foremost accepted in the Beloved, not by anything I can attain to. His Christ-centered, grace-filled focus remains an imperative, a present imperative for all of us. So I'm grateful to Des for two things, for the legacy, but that was the word I was trying to think of, the legacy that he's left for me. is first that warmth of salvation assurance, but secondly the challenges that he leaves us. He gave us questions that set us thinking. I'm not sure that everybody agrees 100% with what Des said, but the question marks that he leaves give us a challenge to keep thinking, to keep discussing, and to keep studying. We may convince ourselves that we have all the answers, but none of us has. Let's be diligent students of the Word. Keep growing in our understanding of God and His love for us. His legacy demands nothing less of us. After only a very few years of, as an Adventist Christian, Julian Wastel turned up at Avondale. 
She stood at the back of the registration line with a vague idea of what she was to do, studying subjects, she thought. But by the time she got to the head of the line and with the advice of a few strong-minded theologians in the line, she had become a Bible worker student. And this catapulted her directly into the class called Daniel and Revelation, taught by one Dr. Desmond Ford. Gillian, the new Adventist, wrote a research paper that stunned and astonished the lecturer. And by 1967, Gillian was secretary to death in the theology department. And by 1970, and graduation as a secondary teacher, she had skills not only in teaching, but in theology, in typing, in French and German. Put that together and imagine the skills she needed to contribute to the speed and success of Desmond's second PhD study stint in Manchester. You'd have to say that was providential because she certainly helped and Des ploughed through that program in record speed with the now properly acknowledged Gillian at his side. Jill was loved and admired by Gwen Ford and after Gwen's untimely death, Jill became loved and cherished by the Ford family. And almost 50 years later, we, her family and friends, love and cherish her too. And we thank her for a half century of loving ministry. Spent at the side of the man she loved. It's a great Avondale love story. Jill is with us today and we welcome her. She has elected to share with us by video and you will understand and appreciate that. But do greet her and thank her at the end of the service. So now let's hear from Mrs. Gillian Ford. I want to read to you two statements from Des, which I believe represent the heart of what he taught, one on justification and one on forgiveness. On justification, we are convinced, as St Paul was, that forgiveness, if forgiveness there is to be, must vindicate the moral law that sin has outraged. The very act that mediates pardon must also proclaim judgment. Mercy cannot replace justice, it must itself be justice. Is this possible? Can such a forgiveness be found? Can the problem of man's sin be solved in such a way? It was St Paul's conviction that the solution was found in Christ. In him, by a crowning act of grace, God had reconciled the world unto himself. In him, Paul found himself justified, delivered from the guilt and condemnation of the law. What the law could not do, God's grace had done. And in such a way that so far from making void the law, it had established the law. This is a mystery before which all human words and thoughts fail. A mystery which grows ever deeper the more it is pondered. Justification, says Brooke, is the most incomprehensible thing that exists. All of the marvels are miracles on the circumference of being. But this is the miracle in the centre of being, in the personal centre. If the question be pressed, what did Christ do? We can only make answer in words, 
the full meaning of which we cannot fathom. He came into the world, as he said, to give his life a ransom for many. He made atonement for the sin of the world. He died for the ungodly. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree, and every Christian heart, making a personal application of all this, says, He loved me, and he gave himself for me. And now on forgiveness. Father, forgive them. That was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. He will make intercession for the transgressors. But it is more. It is the clue to our first need. We do not begin to live until we shut the door on the past through divine forgiveness. No one lives properly until they experience forgiveness. Fortunately, it's not hard to know whether we receive it. It makes one in turn, forgiving to all others. This does not mean conniving with evil. The platitude is true that we should hate the sin, but love the sinner. If one is not able to forgive, it means that we have not experienced forgiveness ourselves. Forgiveness is the bridge that all must pass over who enter the kingdom of God. Forgiveness is the door to the temple beautiful of the Christian life. Learn also from this saying that every relationship of life calls for forgiveness. There are no perfect wives, perfect husbands, and no perfect children or workmen or employees. There are no perfect neighbors. Perhaps this is in part a good thing. How proud we would feel if we ever suspected that we had arrived. We see in Christ an absolute absence of bitterness or resentment. What a challenge for us to avoid harsh judgment. Bearing Rule wrote a warning for us how ready we are to attribute evil purpose to people, how ready to take umbrage at little undesigned offences, and to assume that they were intentional slights. What a reproach we receive from Christ on the cross. He hears the outrageous words of his enemies, he sees their insolent gestures. He feels their piercing cruelty in hands and feet and head. And yet, he finds an excuse. He palliates their offence. Besides this marvellous love, how mean and unchristian is our touchiness, captiousness and uncharitableness. We may learn one thing more, that many an evil act may be done from a misguided mind and from a converted conscience, and will meet with lenient sentence from God. The great thing about this, and what he taught, was that he was able to emulate it. I personally found that forgiveness is an ongoing work. Something comes up, you have to start forgiving it all over again. But Des, it seemed to me, was able to rise above criticism and forgive his enemies, and it was sincere, something for all of us to copy. In the last years and months, through a series of accidents, Des's powers were slowly stripped away. From New Year's Eve, that accelerated. He was found to have several lung conditions, a long span of widespread pneumonia, and a blood clot in the right lung. A week later, he had a series of spectacular falls from up in the turret, a sort of attic in which he loved to live and study. He fell down two staircases and crawled through two rooms. I found him on his back. We think he had a stroke, got out of bed and couldn't stand up, then repeatedly fell. The wonderful thing about Des was that as his marvellous mind lost its great abilities and he was mostly unable to get up and walk, what was left was so beautiful. His character fashioned by a life focused on Christ. The nursing staff at the hospital and rest home all came and spoke to me and said, what a beautiful man, 
what a wonderful man. He's so kind, so polite, so thankful. They saw that he had been with Christ. I was sitting by in his bed when a new nurse came in. And what's your name? he said. She replied, I'm Jackie. And he said, well, I'm Desi, and this is Jilly. <laughs> in hospital, a black nurse from Zimbabwe came and we were talking. And I said, Des wants to leave the planet, don't you, Des? He replied, I sure do. She said, where are you going? And Des said, I'm going to be with him through the enduring ages. And it will be wonderful. Laura Lipo brings us a message from Des's daughter. Monday the 11th of March, at 90 years of age. My father told me when I arrived home for Christmas that he thought he had something that would take him out, but that I was to return to Christian Counseling Education Foundation in the USA and not come home for his funeral. We walked together three times a day for my first week home. Then he was diagnosed with pneumonia and went downhill from there. We knew he was dying on January 7, which made it gut-wrenching to leave him on January 11. But when my father learned that he was dying, he threw his arms in the air and said, hooray. <laughs> he had preached his last sermon in November and he felt that his life's work was over. To his biographer, my father was a reformist theologian and a gospel revivalist. To me, he was the sun in my solar system, my mentor, my pastor, my confidant, my go-to person. His unconditional love, <coughs> compassion, patience, forgiveness and sacrifice showed me Christ. His favourite scripture was Romans 8, 28 to 39. My father devoted his life to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ as he saw our crucified Lord and Saviour as the key to life and death. I know I will see him and my mother when Christ returns. Come, Lord Jesus, come. So the time has come to look beyond Desmond the man, the preacher, the teacher, to the central message that consumed him all his life, the message that lit up his world and ours, the message that still transforms lives just as it did his and ours. This message today will be carried first on the wings of song brought to us by Marion Moroni as she asks us to embrace the cross. Then the gospel will be proclaimed in word by Desmond's friend, Dr. Norman Young. Norman graduated from being a student of Des to becoming a PhD student in Manchester just as Des had done to becoming a colleague with Des on the Avondale faculty and friend for life. So, hear now the gospel in music and in word.
I came to college in 1962, only six months after being baptized from a non-religious secular background. I came as an immature novice Christian, hungering for understanding and thirsting for knowledge. Jez Ford was the person chosen by God to do the war trip. I could not have wished for a better one than Des Ford. 1962, the year I came, was his second year as a lecturer. And it was, I'm not ashamed to say, he above all others. But there were others, of course, who helped me to grow. But it was he above all others who gave me an understanding of the gospel of Christ. As Paul himself says in one place, 1 Corinthians 3, 6, one planet and other waters, but it's God who gives the growth. But certainly it does play the part. Also in 1962, a big part in fact, Erdman's published a book, which I read well as a college, only 189 pages, I reckon that's the limit of books. <laughs> William Charles Robinson's book was entitled The Reformation, A Rediscovery of Grace. And in my mind, Des Ford also proclaimed a rediscovery of grace. It was central to his teaching and his preaching. And through him I came to understand more deeply the joy of the gospel of Christ. So what is grace? The snappy definitions are correct but lifeless. Undeserved favour, unearned acceptance, unmerited forgiveness, all true but not moving. Hebrews 11.4 tells us, speaking of Abel, that though dead, he yet speaketh. And although death has taken, been taken from us, I believe he yet speaketh. And I'm not thinking of DVDs and CDs and YouTube. I'm thinking of all those students who heard that gospel. Of all those campgrounds and university meetings and youth meetings. All those who say I was moved in my heart and soul by the word of grace. This was my effort to say this is how I understood it and I'm offering it to his memory and thanks. Paul started nearly all his letters with the word of grace. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Every letter I just quoted from Romans 1 7, but you can find it in 1 Corinthians 1 3 and 2 Corinthians 1 2, etc. Grace to you, that you is a plural, by the way, in the Greek, and peace from God, our Father. Jesus Christ. The text that my mind immediately gravitated to when I thought of the word grace is 2 Corinthians 8 9. For you know the grace of Christ. Though he were rich, for your sakes he became poor, that through him you may become rich. And not talking about uh, winning on the stock market. It's not even talking about a 1.5 billion that somebody just recently won in the USA in some kind of lottery. I was told about that as I walked over and wondered what I would do with 1.5 billion. I 
I'm not allowed to mention my wife, but she would have no problems with that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was not a mention of her, and if you heard that, then you're hearing things. <laughs> For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, concessive clause, though he were rich. For your sakes, he became poor. Ultimately, that's more than incarnation, and that's the cross. So that through him, you might become rich, rich in the grace of God. And it tells us something about grace, for your sakes. So it's self-giving, it's other-centered, and it's, there's a certain giftness about it. In fact, giftness is the word you get in Ephesians 2.8, the well-known text. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, or my translation has, this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. A gift. I like gifts, but I have had to learn to accept gifts graciously. I didn't always do that. I remember one time my daughter gave me a book. I like books, but when I tore the paper off, it was a biography of Ray Martin, and how disrespectful this gentleman. It wasn't a biography I wanted to read, and something on my face told me about it. They told my daughter about it, and she said, you don't like the book, do you, Dad? <laughs> um, can you exchange it? Give it back to me, which she did. And she put it in, got the money, and I never heard it again. <laughs> so I missed out on the gift. Don't miss out on this gift. When it says, it is the gift of God, it is a neuter pronoun, so don't think it goes back to the word faith, because that's feminine. Nor does it go back to the word grace, because charis is also feminine. No, it's going back to the whole process. For by grace you've been saved, through faith, not your own doing, not of yourselves, lest any man boast or person boast. It is the gift of God. So that tells us again something about our grace. It is a gift of God. Gift. As soon as you think of the word gift, if your mind doesn't race to Romans 5, you need to read Romans again. And I'm going to read potted bits and tossed some bits out as I went, <laughs> just to reduce it, because they said, not one second over seven minutes and I think I'm already in trouble. I shouldn't have told that story about 1.5 billion. <laughs> not covered in it, not at all. Not even a little, maybe a tiny bit. <laughs> yes, the gift of God. But the free gift is the way the New Revised Standard Version translates goes. But the free gift is not like the trespass. That is the transgression of Adam. Not like that. The free gift surpasses it mightily, grandly, sublimely, profoundly, hugely. For the many died through that one man's, Adam's, trespass. Much more surely have the grace of God. Notice how they're intertwining these great words. Gift, grace, God. The, much more surely the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of that one man, not Adam now, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses, brings acquittal. The opposite to condemnation. Justification, if you like. Righteousness, if you like, because dikaiosinate does mean righteousness, justification, acquittal. 
If because the one man is trespassed, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of acquittal exercise dominion in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. The law came in, that's true, but when it came in, sin increased. But where sin increased, grace more abounded. So there's a real good definition of grace. It's a free gift, a free gift of acquittal. But behind gifts, you know, there's always a giver. And one near to me will know what's in my mind when I behaved shabbily when receiving a gift. Because when you don't receive a gift graciously, you reject the giver. It is not a gift that you can put in a box or some trivial trinket. This is an extraordinary gift and behind the gift is always the giver. And if you receive the gift, you acknowledge, you accept, you enter into a relationship with the giver. And relationships are reciprocal. They are interactive. They are mutual. They are not one-sided. To have a one-sided relationship is like a one-handed clap. It's not very useful. It is impossible to have a one-sided gift. If you're in a relationship where it's all give and no receive, something wrong. It's a sharing. And a sharing of each other. Not just the things, though sometimes it's expressed through things. So that's what God gives us as one of his gifts. He gives himself, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, which is just a long way around of saying forgives them. Every covenant, and what is a covenant? A covenant is a promise, a promise that is usually made by an oath, or a vow. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by God, or whether you look at that promise in its fulfillment at Sinai, or whether you look at the uh, promise that he makes to the King David, that there will always be a Judean king on the throne, the Davidic covenant promise, or if you look at the new covenant promise of Jeremiah, there is one element that is in all of them. And that is a relationship. A promise that I will be their God and they shall be my people. But when you come, of course, to a king, David, it becomes personalized. Not I will be their God and they shall be people, but I will be his father. And he shall be my son. Now the interesting thing is Paul quotes both covenants, one from Sinai and one from Second uh, Samuel 7.14. The one from Sinai, I'm quoting, that he quotes, is Leviticus 26 verse 12 and then Second Samuel 7.14, covenant that David listened to his words. First I'll read Leviticus 26.12. Changes 
the Hebrew scriptures. What about that? He makes it in plural, not the singular. I will be a father to him, and he will be my son. That is the king on the Judean throne. But now it's, and I, they shall be my sons and daughters. Huh? Daughters are not in the text. Paul's added daughters. Paul was not compliant. <laughs> Old age has few advantages. I don't like getting old at all. You notice I walked up these stairs. I did not hang onto the rails. I walked carefully, but without those rails, because the only one I saw who did that was Laramie. Where are all the other went through that door? Walked up and see. I thought, no, I'm going to walk up in front of everybody and Lord, don't let me fall. <laughs> there are some advantages, though, very few. $2.50 on the train <laughs> and the fer ferry and the buses all day. Oh, I tell you to thank the heavens for great power because the government should put that up there, shouldn't they? <laughs> and the other gift of old age of grandchildren. In fact, I can't mention my wife, but somebody I know and, <laughs> and myself, we think that grandchildren are so wonderful, so precious, so beautiful, such a gift. And we don't know why we didn't have them first. <laughs> <laughs> Those were three grandchildren of ours know we love them. They know that that love is unconditional. They know that that love is forgiving and full of grace. But every now and then, they don't behave appropriately within a covenant promise relationship. <laughs> One of them is able to repeat quite swiftly, for I reckon he'd go all day and night if it did. I want a lolly, I want a lolly, I want a lolly. I want a lolly, I want a lolly, I want a lolly. Well, that's the hell that put my nerves. And he used to give a lolly, but I don't think that's a good thing to do uh, because he really loves lollies. So I take him by the hand, breathe him deeply, and take him out of the family room and place him into the lounge room. Sit here, Kirby. And when you, you think you can behave appropriately, that is, when you can stop this recessive bleeding, um, come to the door, knock on the door, and I'll let you in. Now, I'm not a psychologist, and I'm pretty sure the psychologist said, that is terrible what you're doing to that child. <laughs> you are uh, taking away that relationship. You are banishing. You are closing the door and shutting him out there by himself. Well, he's got a few toys there. <laughs> but what the psychologist doesn't have, that I do have, is a huge love for that child. And that child knows he has that. And he thinks it's true. And after a while, he knocks on the door. And I open the door, are you ready to behave better? Yes, come in then. Here are all your toys. Relationships impact on our behaviour. The question I get more than any other, and this the same, if it's all of grace, why are we judged by works? If it's all of grace, why does my ethical behaviour matter? Why does what I do matter? Because behind the gift, is the giver. And you can't just have the books in heaven messed up with or fixed up with it, as if it was that kind of transaction. The forgiveness, the mercy, the acquittal of God, that gift involves him, involves him giving himself. God was in Christ reconciled. Christ gave himself on the cross. 
cross. That is the act of the Father. So if we accept that gift, we enter into relationship. And relationships that are healthy and wholesome always impact on behavior. We know, just as Kobe at five, six, seven years of age, knew that his behavior didn't earn my love. Because that kind of love, that kind of relationship, of a friendship, of a parent, of a spouse, of a child, when we give that love to the other and enter into that personal interaction, it can never be earned. Next year, 50 years married to the same woman, I'm good to that. <laughs> Is that a gift that she still gives? Of course. But I do the dishes. <laughs> I come home on time, or if I'm late, I ring, if I remember. <laughs> Most of you do. No, no, no deeds. I'm not going to trot out the deeds. I mow the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say I accept the gift. But it impacts on my relationship. About six texts talk about pleasing God. I want to please God. I don't have a truce with evil. I don't make a friendship <laughs> with wrongdoing. I don't plan to hurt people. Mercifully, in all healthy relationships, there is forgiveness. But never impose on that forgiveness. Never think that you deserve it and that you can command it or demand it. No. Healthy relationships are giving and receiving, not taking it to aggressive. Giving and receiving, both giving and receiving. And that's why works are evidence of a healthy relationship. They don't procure it, they don't deserve it, they don't earn it because that gift, even at the human level, is unearnable. God bless you. Now we'll walk down the steps. Godspeed and good evening.